Welcome into the Sports Memo NHL betting podcast, where today we bring in our NHL expert, Andrew McGinnis, going over the uh, NHL card for tonight. And without further ado, Andrew, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today, bud? Andrew, great to be here. And uh, yeah, the season's in full roll now, and it's uh, off to a great start so far. And uh, yeah, a lot of teams that I really expected to be excelling are doing so. And I feel like I have a decent read so far, but the season's only young, and I'm looking forward to doing these podcasts with you every single week. So it's uh, it's a great day. How are you? Yeah, good, and 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 happy to have you on. Learn a little bit more about uh, NHL betting. You know, get get some philosophies out, and also break down some games. And and you're right, the season has been good for you so far, hitting 60 percent on the year. The numbers are 42 and 28. That's year to date right now. And guys, if you want to jump on board, we're making it real easy as far as a coupon code NHL50. That's just NHL, and then uh, the, the the 50 five zero, and you would get fifty dollars off of any of McGinnis's packages. That's seven day, thirty day, ninety day, uh, full season, wh- wh- whatever you want to do. NHL50 to get uh, fifty dollars off of his services, but. McGinnis, let's break down uh, some games. Starting at the top of the card, we got uh, game number 51-52, the Florida Panthers at the New York Rangers. And it looks like the Panthers laying anywhere from minus 125 to minus 130 at Bookmaker with uh, a high total here. You've taught me already um, if they're showing six and a halves. That's, uh, that's a little bit high for the NHL, but we're seeing six or six and a half, six and a half at most shops. But how would you look to bet the uh, Panthers and Rangers tonight? Drew, I feel like every time I'm on a podcast with you, uh, I'm just talking negatively about the New York Rangers. And, you know, they're a team that's competing in games and they're in games. And, you know, they're not a team that's completely disastrous, but they're still a team I'm looking to fade. Uh, And especially coming into this one specifically, uh, this is this Florida Panthers team, Drew, is a team that is absolutely underachieved. Uh, This is a team that just recently got their first win on the season, uh, but they are one, two and three on the season, meaning they have three uh, losses in either an overtime or shootout and to me that just shows you that they're competing in games they're you know almost there they're coming very close and you know the biggest thing for this Florida Panthers team right now in my eyes is getting production throughout their entire lineup uh, you've got guys like Vincent Trocek uh, of course their captain Alexander Barkov those guys you can count on uh, Jonathan Huberdeau guys like that uh, Mike Hoffman you need to have everyone contributing and I think that as the season progresses they will step things up and this Florida team will look a lot better uh, than what they've shown us so far but you know like I've said countless times in this short period of time that I've uh, worked with you on these NHL podcasts Drew this New York Rangers team is is declining Uh, they're a team that used to be so incredibly good consistently every single year making the playoffs uh, doing very well and we're we're right now tonight Drew we're seeing two backup goaltenders in nets and you know, that kind of worries me. That's one of those things right now where I think that that gives a massive, massive advantage to the Florida Panthers. Uh, of course, the New York Rangers have the, the goalie in Henrik Lundqvist, Lundqvist, who I talk about quite often as a goalie who's solid, uh, but he's on the decline right now, and he's a very mentally weak goalie. Uh, but we got Hutchison in nets right now for Florida. Uh, he hasn't lost in the season so far in regulation. And, of course, uh, Georgiev uh, for the Rangers. And he's a goalie that I really, really question so the Rangers sitting at a two and five and one record right now. I would look this one to be a low scoring game, but Florida kind of takes care of business very quietly. I can't see this one being too exciting. Florida is a lot better of a team than what they've shown, which is why we're getting the decent line that we are being offered. Uh, Florida is way, way, way ahead of my power rankings in the Eastern Conference over the New York Rangers. We'll start this slate off very simple and we'll take the Florida Panthers on the money line. And uh, McGinnis, you say the, the, the Panthers were one, two and three as far as their record. Yes. And and it's interesting because you bring up that uh, that three at the end. Obviously, in other sports, it's not really like that. Um, and, and do you think for betting philosophy, getting a team like that, because you, 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 in in the standings, a team would get one point, right, for uh, overtime loss? Is that correct? Exactly. And so do you think that there's betting value as far as kind of teams under the radar like you just explained the Panthers as far as three losses in overtime so it's not really reflected in their wins but they're right there in the game or is the betting markets kind of on to that as far as in the NHL betting these teams and kind of getting ahead of that I'd say I'd say so 100% I mean you've got this Florida team Drew that was being compared to the Detroit Red Wings uh, and this Detroit team is absolutely awful it seems 
it seems to me, and you don't hear about this a lot, uh, Drew, in hockey, it seems to me this Detroit team's already thinking about that number one overall draft pick for next season. I mean, uh, they, they're producing, they're sending out rough, rough lineups, rough line combinations, and their defensive pairings are looking terrible. But they were being compared to Florida last week simply because of their records, right? So it's a great question you ask because, you know, that three at the end of their record dictates they could easily have been in all of those games or had a win in all those games because – in my eyes, Drew, I don't, wouldn't usually say something like this, but you know, it's now three on three overtime in the NHL. It's practically a coin flip, uh, so those games could have gone in either direction, uh, which is why I give the Panthers uh, a lot more credit than they're getting right now. So you know, we're getting a minus 120, 125, 130 some spots, but uh, you know what? New York at home, back up Tendy and Nets. I'll, I'll gladly take the Panthers. That's awesome. It's three on three. I mean, it's exciting to watch. High scoring anyway. It's funny that you say a coin flip. You also said uh, there's backup goaltenders. Is that due to injury or due to just kind of giving guys rest? Uh, just giving guys rest. I mean, uh, Lundqvist has been playing an extraordinary amount for, for the Rangers. And uh, I think almost he's been overused realistically. And I think it's really because they're such a struggling team with the 2-5-1 and one record. You know, and you got Florida coming in, and it's a good opportunity, based off the record anyway, to kind of get Georgia uh, in the game and, and, you know, in some playing time and more or less just give Lundquist some rest, which honest, honestly, Drew, ultimately helped me with this Florida Panthers money line uh, because if Lundquist is in nets, I'm a little more hesitant. Uh, Florida picking up some steam now, got their first win under their belt. Uh, they got their talented players finally finding the score sheet. Uh, you know, this game really screams Florida to me. And, you know, you're asking me all the time about – you know, home ice advantage, what that means, if it's really that big of an advantage. And I've told you this New York team does not play well at home. They don't they don't take care of the puck in their own end. They're very turnover friendly. They, you know, pass that puck around like a hot potato. And uh, Florida's going to take advantage of it with their all-stars. So I think, you know, a lower scoring game, but Florida dominates this game. All right, we got 57-58, 7.30 Eastern start in this one. Boston at Ottawa, north of the border here. But Boston's still laying minus 170 at some shops. The road team heavily favored here. Six the total, McGinnis. Drew, that one has climbed quite a bit. Opened up around minus 150, 155, and the public has absolutely hammered them. Absolutely hammered them. And, you know, this is one of those ones here. You're looking at two teams with the exact same record. Boston Bruins, 4-2-2 two two in the season. Ottawa, 4-2-1. and one. Uh, So a little bit different, I guess, uh, with the overtime losses and wins. But ultimately... If you looked at this game before the season started, Drew, you'd regularly think that Boston would be laying closer to minus 200. And that's the truth. But Ottawa has really come to life. They've proved people that they actually are a decent team. They can skate. Uh, but I've been talking about this for the past couple of days, Drew, and I want everyone to pay attention when I say this. Teams that aren't elite often, often have good starts to, get to, see, to seasons strictly because there's no pressure. I don't care if nobody buys into that. I really do believe in that, and it's a philosophy that I've believed in for a while. You know, teams like Montreal, a lot of people didn't have any expectations for them going into the season. Just like Ottawa, they're off to a terrific start. Now, will that continue? We'll find out. I don't think it will whatsoever with this Ottawa team. We have to give them credit when credit's due. Uh, they've, you know, come up big. They've had comebacks. They've had low-scoring wins. They've had high-scoring wins, and they've really proved themselves. But when it comes down to it, Drew, on the sheet, on paper, uh, this lineup is just not elite whatsoever. Uh, you've got a guy like uh, Mikel Bodker on your top line, Colin White, uh, who wasn't even dressing regularly on this team just two years ago. you got a guy like Bobby Ryan now on the third line. This is a guy that used to be an all-star for the Anaheim Ducks down there on the third line now. Uh, it's kind of a disgrace in my eyes. Uh, but, you know, then we switch over to the Boston Bruins who are having a tough time on the road right now, an absolute tough time, tail end of the road trip right now. I mean, uh, I had them. I, I took them last week on our podcast at the end of our football podcast there, Drew, at the tail end of their road trip against Vancouver. And I'll be honest, uh, they outright did not perform for me. Uh, you know, I'll admit it when it happens. We're one and one on, on that show. But that really, really proved to me that this Boston team has to step things up. It was one of those games for them where they produced a lot of shots, but they weren't quality shots. And I've been preaching for the longest time that chemistry is the biggest thing. Now, the best line in hockey, in my eyes, despite the stats so far this season, is still Brad Marchand, Patrice Bergeron, and David Pasternak. Those three guys produce like no others, Drew. If you watch this game tonight, I guarantee 
uh, you'd be messaging me and saying, wow, these guys stand out way more than anybody else in that roster. And this is one of those spots for me, Drew. I- I'm going back to the well with Boston, to be honest with you. I know we're laying quite a bit of juice. I don't want to go with the puck line, uh, so it's more of a slight kind of lean. Uh, I also like the over in this one. This is a spot that the Bruins have to take care of. Uh, they had a terrible, terrible West Coast road trip. Uh, we're going to talk about road trips at the end of this podcast to kind of end things off. Um, they fell short with a terrible start versus Calgary. They did not produce well against Edmonton, and they came out flat once again against the Vancouver Canucks. That cannot happen. Now they're rolling in against a more weaker squad, a team that should be riding a lot of highs right now in the Ottawa Senators after coming back and defeating the Montreal Canadiens in overtime. And you know what? They're going to be a little bit too you know, high, I think, and be feeling a little bit too uh, good about themselves. And I think Boston comes in and just completely wipes the smile off their face tonight. And that's why the public's hammering them. Sometimes the public does know what they're talking about. And I think tonight they do. I also think it will be a high-scoring game. I think Boston comes out firing shots from all angles, quality shots. And believe it or not, uh, if anyone wants to believe frustrations or not, I think certain teams wake up a little more hungry for games uh, than others. And I think this is one that they have to wake up for. They have to be hungry for. It's a big win for them. So I'm going to go with the Bruins in this one and the over. Like in the Bruins, okay. Uh, good, good stuff there, McGinnis. We got a uh, good good breakdown. We got um, coupon code NHL50, $50 off any of McGinnis's NHL services. Moving down the card here, we got 59, San Jose at Nashville. Five and a half the total. Looks like uh, Nashville laying minus 128 at home, McGinnis. This is a big game. This is a big game on the slate here, Drew. I mean, this is a San Jose Sharks team that was very highly talked about coming into the season. Of course, after picking up all-star defenseman Eric Carlson from the Ottawa Senators, this is a team that's supposed to have a very dangerous, very elite uh, defensive core back there on the blue line with Justin Braun, uh, Carlson, Vlasic, uh, Brent Burns, and those guys have not really looked elite in my eyes whatsoever. They've been very easily walked all over. And they had a very slow start to the season, and it hasn't impressed me whatsoever. So I'm not going to head into this game thinking they're going to turn things around. The only thing that they've really done, Drew, is beat bad teams. They've produced against teams that aren't that great. They're coming into a game now where they're playing an actual elite team uh, in the Nashville Predators, who in my eyes will be right back there in the Western Conference Championship uh, once again this year. I mean, you're talking about a team that has Ryan Johansson, Kyle Turris, Nick Bonino, uh, and Colton Sissons as your four centers. Uh, it's unbelievable. And then around those guys, Philip Forsberg, Victor Arvidsson, uh, even Kevin Fiala, those guys are outstanding. This, this, this team can produce on a nightly basis. And then we go down to their blue line, which in my eyes is one of the best blue lines really in the league. Uh, and Roman Yossi, Ellis, P.K. Subban, uh, Matthias Ekholm. The list really goes on, Drew, with this Predators team. But one thing with these guys as well uh, you know, as much as I love their decor, Drew, I talk about them very highly, but they're one of those, you know, defensive pairings that love to jump up into the rush. They love to get into the action. You know, you talk about a defenseman being a stay at home defenseman or a two way defenseman or, you know, a goal, a goal scoring defenseman. And you wouldn't really talk about that a lot back in the day. But the way that hockey has advanced, you really want all your players pushing up and being aggressive. And that's exactly what this Nashville team does. So once again, we're seeing a five and a half total. Uh, which you know really screams out to me whenever I see these uh, these days, Drew. Uh, like I told you before, six is the new norm. We're seeing six and a half. So we've actually seen a seven so far this year. Uh, so ultimately, I'm going to look for Nashville on the money line, and I'm going to look for the over five and a half until San Jose proves to me they can be consistent on their power play, consistent in regulation, consistent five on five, until their guys can show up on a nightly basis. They're heading into Bridgestone Arena, one of the toughest buildings to play in uh, in the entire National Hockey League. And uh, San-, San Jose is actually getting a fair percentage of the wagers. So I'm going to go the other way, take Nashville on the money line, and go over five and a half goals. All right, good stuff, McGinnis. And guys, you're listening to the Sports Memo Podcast. You can use uh, coupon code NHL50 for any of McGinnis's NHL packages at sportsmemo.com. We got the NHL podcast today. We got uh, college football, every game on the board going tomorrow and on Thursday. And we will have the NFL, every game on the board on Friday. McGinnis, let's get one more game in here for the NHL. And then a, a couple uh, handicapping questions got for you. And also, guys, make sure to uh, reach out to McGinnis on Twitter at McGinnis Picks 
or myself at Drew Martin Bets for uh, any handicapping questions you got in the NHL or uh, really any sport overall. Um, anything you want to do, just shoot it over to us on Twitter. We'll answer it on the podcast. But we got game number 65, 66 here, Pittsburgh at Edmonton. Looks like it's the last game on the card, 9 p.m. Eastern start. We got minus 120, Pittsburgh laying on the road, six the total, I guess. Drew, I'm not even going to take a look or even touch the total in this one. It's all side for me. And this is, you know what, I changed my mind what I said about the San Jose and Nashville game. This right here is the absolute biggest game, most important game on the card from strictly a viewership perspective from a hockey perspective, from a competitiveness perspective, but also, in my eyes, an actual strictly betting perspective. These are two teams that honestly should be at the highest point in the NHL. These guys should be at the highest point in the standings with the talent level that they have. However, they have not been off to the most outstanding starts. They have, in my eyes, the two best players in the National Hockey League. It's been a current debate who is the best player, who's more elite. Is Connor McDavid ahead of Sidney Crosby? And I think we'll find that out really tonight and over the next couple of weeks as the season progresses. Uh, but in my eyes, when it comes down to it, this Pittsburgh Penguins team has the supporting cast. And that's one thing you'll hear me talk about time and time again about the you know National Hockey League, the way I do my handicapping in the NHL. I'm all about depth. I'm all about scoring that's around the entire lineup, not just one or two guys. You know, you look at the NBA, you look at college basketball, you realistically can have a few guys that carry a team. It's not like that uh, in the NHL. You have to have that supporting cast. And that's one thing I'll give people that, you know, kind of say Crosby's been, been carried by people his whole career or, you know, had that great supporting cast. He is a great player, but he also has had Malkin, uh, you know, Kessel recently. Of course, Derek Broussard now, Jake Gensel, Haglin, Rust. All those guys are just so talented around him that it makes for a great outstanding core. Uh, now, looking at Edmonton, uh, first of all, they're a little bit injured. They're a little bit banged up right now, and that hurts them. Uh, of course, you got Ty Ratty, who was just on the first line out with an injury now. That hurts the Oilers. But uh, top pairing of Nugent Hopkins, McDavid, and now uh, Yamamoto, who's a guy uh, that is really supposed to be producing and stepping things up and having a good performance, but he hasn't done nearly anything so far this season. So he has to step up. And on the second line, we've got Ryder, uh, Dreisaitl and Pugliarvi, who are guys that realistically, Drew, I cannot rely on on a weekly basis. So when I look at this matchup, I look at Pittsburgh, 3-1-2 uh, and two on the season, but they're one of those teams, I'm telling you, they're one of those teams that really wakes up in the morning a little more excited to go to the rink for certain games. This is one they have circled. This is an important game for them. I think this one will be pure dominance uh, from the Pittsburgh Penguins. They've got Matt Murray uh, between the pipes, and I think they'll take care of business quite easily. Uh, so at the minus 119 number, I'll take the Penguins. McGinnis, it's interesting you bring up, uh, I guess, how valuable each player is in the NHL, and you brought up, you know, NBA or college basketball. Like NBA, for example, you know, one player matters so much, whereas maybe in the NFL, you know, it's, it's still 11 11- you know, simultaneous matchups happening. So one player can only matter, you know, it's definitely a lot less than the NBA. Where would right. you put the NHL in there? Would you, would you say it's as important each player as the NBA or, or, or in between kind of the NBA and the NFL? I would say it's in between. I mean, the fact is you look at teams like the Maple Leafs, Drew, where you've got guys like Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, Jonathan, or John Tavares, those guys are your top players, but they're still not really out on that ice you know, they're out there less than a third of the time, right? So you've got to count on those guys down there on the third line, on the fourth line to produce. And you'd never, ever see a winning team that wins the Stanley Cup uh, that hasn't had production from those guys that you wouldn't usually see. I mean, you look at Vegas last year, Drew, a guy like Ryan Reeves, who is the toughest guy in the NHL in my eyes, one of the really the lone enforcers and fighter type guys left in the league, he scored two crucial goals. Uh, he scored some big goals last year or two years ago. Uh, Zach Cassian for the Edmonton Oilers, who's also a fighter and a tough guy and a gritty guy, he scored a few big goals uh, in their playoff run. So it's all about the depth. It's all about you know having that entire core uh, stepping up to produce. And you know, just you mentioned that Drew, and it, made, it reminded me of uh, an analyst talking about Austin Matthews for the Leafs not getting enough ice time, and I think that's also a problem. I mean, you can look at the NBA with the timeouts, the TV breaks, you know. 
free throws, stuff like that, that can really slow the pace down, let guys catch their breath. But you've got guys right now complaining that Austin Matthews is not getting enough ice time. He doesn't even get 20 minutes a night, Drew, and he's supposedly one of the best players in the league. I think it's kind of peculiar, but, I mean, certain coaches like to spread things out more than others. But uh, to answer your question, I really do believe it's all about the depth scoring. All right, and uh, McGinnis, let's end it on this one. We talked about uh, Boston-Ottawa a little earlier with Boston laying a heavy price on the road. What about uh, handicapping tips or philosophy you have with good teams on long road trips? How do, how do you look to bet that scenario? Well, this is a question that I, I, I really wanted to talk about today because looking at the way Boston looked at, on their West Coast road trip, a lot of teams right now from the West Coast are heading out East, uh, East heading out West, and it's important to really monitor these games and monitor how teams are. I'm not saying I'm a situational type better, but certain times you can look at games uh, and, and realize it's a lot better of a spot for a team versus another spot. And so what I mean by that is really, really watch, unless you're getting great odds, I would stay away from a team on their first game uh, of a West Coast road trip. Look for them on that second game, especially if it's a close, tight loss. Look for them to bounce back, especially if it's an elite team like Boston, like Toronto, like Pittsburgh. And at the tail end of a road trip, a lot of people say, oh, you know, it's the tail end of the road trip. They're probably tired. You know, they're, they're looking forward to getting home. The tail end of the road trip, in my eyes, is one of the best spots to take a, take a team. You look yesterday, Colorado Avalanche, tail end of their road trip. They're probably tired. They played a lot of games in a row, a lot of ice time for their top stars. And they come in and absolutely roll the Philadelphia Flyers put up an excellent defensive performance because that's what coaches care about. And I, I really do read in a lot to what coaches care about, what players are saying to the media. And a lot of it, you know, the, the beginning of a road trip, you got that excuse, right? What's your excuse at the end of a road trip? In my eyes, you know, you have a lot more of an excuse at the beginning. Uh, in the end, you got to end strong and, and have a competitive game. So realistically, when you see a team like Boston, like Toronto, like Montreal, like Florida, those teams in the East traveling around to the West Coast, you know, places like Edmonton, like Vancouver, really watch them when they're playing their first game, see how they look, see how they're reacting to the other team, and look for them in that second or third game, because that might be the best spot you can get. McGinnis, great stuff. We'll have you back on uh, Friday to do the N NFL Every Game on the Board podcast. Guys, thanks for listening. Remember, coupon code NHL50 when you're checking out for anything NHL on sportsmemo.com. We'll be back tomorrow with College Football Every Game on the Board podcast.